One of the continuities between Dutch and English rule in colonial New York is this aggressive policy toward the Native American population. Clearly, the destruction of the Iroquois population and the Canarsie population in Manhattan and Long Island is a byproduct of British expansion in those areas. Daniel Denton, who in the 1660s writes one of the first English language histories of the region, or sort of general descriptions of the region, says something rather interesting. Everywhere that the English have gone, the invisible hand of God has prepared a space for them by destroying and removing the native population. My response to that is that men acted far more often than God, and it was the British who prepared that space. They destroyed the native population aggressively through war. They encouraged wars between Native American tribes and nations. And the spread of disease just really reduced a huge portion of this lower New York population. In the end, it would be the fate of New York's original inhabitants to be remembered when they were remembered at all as place names in what had become the most completely man-made environment on Earth. The Dutch and English had set in motion a process of change that would never stop until the entire human and natural landscape of Manhattan Island had been completely replaced. For the next 119 years, England would rule New York. What for the Dutch had been a second-rate outpost of empire was for the English the missing link in a chain of royal colonies stretching the length of the Atlantic seaboard. Slowly but surely, the new English governors brought the colony into the imperial system, reorganizing the lands around the harbor and naming them after members of the royal family. The flatlands around Brooklyn were named King's County in honor of King Charles, and the region to the north, Queens, in honor of his wife, Catherine. Staten Island was named Richmond after the Duke of Richmond, the King's bastard son. Though they did everything they could to ease the transition, the English found it no easier than the Dutch to keep order in the unruly colony. In 1689, a local merchant named Jacob Leisler led an armed uprising against the government. It was soon put down, and Leisler himself tried for treason and sentenced to be hanged, disemboweled while still alive, drawn and quartered, and then beheaded. A few years later, trouble erupted again when a new monarch, Queen Anne, placed her own cousin, an imperious Viscount named Lord Cornbury, in charge of the volatile colony. Petitioning the Queen for his dismissal, Cornbury's enemies did everything they could to ruin his reputation, accusing him of embezzling public funds, persecuting Presbyterians, and, it was later said, of having a special liking for women's clothing. The story that's told is that he wanted to look as much like his cousin Queen Anne, for whom he was ruling the colony as possible, and to do this, he dressed up in women's clothes and, to quote some early sources, flounced around the battery. In fact, there's a portrait of him at the New York Historical Society dressed in a kind of a wasp weight blue number that's very nice indeed. And you walk by and you think, what an ugly woman. And then you go back and you realize that, no, it's in fact Lord Cornberry. But for all the problems, membership in the British Empire brought enormous rewards as England soon surpassed Holland as the greatest maritime empire on earth and connected the colony to a network of trade that stretched around the globe. The more trade routes are developed, the more this becomes a nexus point, a flow of, between England and the Caribbean and the continent, the more people who are local domestic producers, who up till then have produced for a local market only, begin to say, whoa, there are serious possibilities here. This was a trading post. This was a place that was about shipping, food down to the West Indies, bringing sugar and slaves back from the West Indies. But you can't run a mercantile operation without a manufacturing component. So in fact, you need coopers, you need barrel makers. You're gonna have to have ships, you need shipyards. 
Ships, you need sails, you need sail makers, you need rope makers, so rope walks are sort of festooned all over New York City. Year after year, the number of ships sailing out of New York Harbor surged upwards, from 35 a year at the end of Dutch rule to more than 700 a century later, exporting timber and grain to Britain, carrying manufactured goods from England to Africa, and importing rum, molasses, and slaves from Africa and the West Indies. In 1699, the old Dutch wall was pulled down to make way for new houses, and a new lane paved over it, called Wall Street. By 1740, New York had become the third largest port in the British Empire, second only to Philadelphia and London itself. It was home now to an uneasy assortment of old Dutch families and English merchants, privateers and colonial administrators, Protestants and Catholics, free blacks, slave owners, and slaves. While we'd like to think that by the 18th century, New York City was really a model of tolerance and everybody could get along, in fact, there's evidence that there was a lot of resentments, the Dutch versus the English, uh, other groups coming in. Uh, the Jews were here, but they weren't really fully accepted. Blacks, of course, and African-Americans were uh, much the most discriminated against. So it was not a wonderful love fest going on in New York in the 1740s. And in fact, there were a lot of fears. In the winter of 1741, the royal colony exploded over an issue that had troubled it from the very start. Well, of course, I think that what sets the African-American experience apart from the other immigrants is we did not come through Ellis Island. We did not come escaping anything brought here against our will to work, and work we did. In fact, uh, we built the wall for which Wall Street is named, not only literally but figuratively in terms of it was the trade in African flesh that provided the fundamental capital on which Wall Street, the financial wall, is built. So yes, our experience is different. Slavery is the key word. It's key not only in the fact that blacks are used as a public works infrastructure workforce. I mean, they build roads, they build forts, they build walls and the like. But more to the point, the city's raison d'etre at that point is about the connection to the Caribbean slave south and then later on to the mainland slave south. On the one hand, we've got this kind of business-oriented, you know, cosmopolitan city. On the other hand, there's a profound cleavage, and it's based on the exploitation uh, of slave labor. Some white New Yorkers thought the practice barbaric. Slaveholding depraves the mind, one Quaker minister said, with as great certainty as cold congeals water. But year by year, as New York expanded, the demand for slaves grew. By 1740, one in six New Yorkers were owned by other New Yorkers, 2,000 men, women, and children in all. Each morning, African Americans could be seen strolling to the slave market at the foot of Wall Street, where they waited to be rented out for use as day laborers, exchanging news with free blacks and looking for every chance they could to break free. There had been a variety of slave rebellions in the colonies. And I think that New Yorkers were very much aware of these slave rebellions. As the number of slaves increased, they were also very afraid that New Yorkers were, were at risk. They noticed slaves gathering together. They had put prohibitions on slaves meeting on street corners. But they knew that slaves were interested in gaining their freedom in any way that they could and they were very fearful of open revolt. Memories of a bloody slave uprising years before were still vivid in the minds of white New Yorkers when in the winter of 1741, a series of mysterious fires began breaking out all over the city, burning the King's Chapel, the army barracks, and the homes and businesses of prominent New Yorkers. Suspicion quickly fell on the city's black population. 
The recorder, taking notice of the several fires which have lately happened in this city, must necessarily conclude that they were occasioned by some villainous confederacy of latent enemies amongst us. Daniel Horsemanden. In March, as the authorities searched frantically for the guilty parties, an indentured servant named Mary Burton, prompted by the prospect of a hundred dollar reward, came forward to testify against her employer, an Irish Catholic tavern keeper named John Hewson, whose establishment was a favorite meeting place for slaves and free blacks. She told wild tales of a Negro plot to burn the city and overthrow the government, leveling one charge after another against Hewson, his wife, and a growing list of alleged black conspirators. One gets the feeling that Mary Burton forgot what the truth was. Her stories kept getting more and more elaborate as she um, implicated more and more individuals in the, in the um, subversion. And she was absolutely uh, convincing because the officials, the New York City officials, wanted to be convinced that this was a wider conspiracy. There were levels of conspiracy that probably actually were invented by the people investigating the conspiracy. So for instance, the belief that Catholics, and particularly Irish Catholics, were responsible for creating this discontent among the slaves was probably an invention of Protestants looking to protect their self-esteem as masters and looking to reinforce their racial ideas that Africans were incapable of plotting against them on their own. Some blacks had almost certainly been involved. But as the hysteria in Manhattan reached fever pitch, colonial judges ordered a massive roundup of black New Yorkers, and with almost no evidence, put them on trial for their lives. In the weeks to come, the reign of terror visited on blacks, and on anyone suspected of conspiring with them, would be worse than the Salem witch trials half a century before. The real story of 1741 is, in fact, not what the slaves did, but, in fact, what was done to the slaves. The level of ferocity with which the insurrection was repressed and then the punishments that were meted out, despite the fact that these were valuable pieces of property, people were burned at the stake, people were roasted over a slow fire for eight hours that the torment may be dragged out. Medieval tortures, which, in fact, had been utterly banned for conventional and white purposes uh, were in fact resurrected to strike terror into the hearts of the population. Before it was over, 16 blacks and four whites had been hanged in New York. 13 slaves had been burned at the stake and 70 more deported. It would take nearly a century more for black New Yorkers to win their freedom. But it would not be long before English rule was challenged again. Not by African Americans this time, but by the city's restless merchant middle class and an alliance of artisans and sailors. When that happened, the proud royal colony would begin a long journey out of empire, out of the past, and into the future.